Bon, je crois qu'on est... Merci beaucoup. Euh, je vous invite juste à faire passer euh, bon, dans les deux heures à venir des numéros. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome Christopher Brewert here. Um, I will do the introduction in French, as you said that you are. And I won't say anything new to you because it's your biography which you have sent to me. Donc, uh, c'est mon grand plaisir d'annoncer Christopher Brewert, um, qui est venu aujourd'hui uh, chez nous de Leiden, en, en, aux Pays-Bas. Mais il est normalement, uh, il est en sabbatical now. Uh, il est professeur d'histoire culturelle à l'Université de Edinburgh uh, en Écosse. Il est également patron et, ou directeur du Edinburgh College of, College of Art et uh, vice-directeur de l'université uh, qui s'appelle Creative Arts in the same, uh, uh, dans la même ville. Il a suivi sa formation au Courtauld Institute of Art um, for the BA et the Royal College of Art for the MA et the PhD. Toutes, toutes les deux, tous les deux, des, non, toutes les deux institutions sont des institutions très prestigieuses de Londres, bien connues. Il a enseigné dans plusieurs universités euh, et collèges, j'en cite quelques-uns, c'est Ma Manchester Metropolitan University, the Royal College of Art and the London College of Fashion. Il était directeur de la recherche euh, au Victoria and Albert Museum à Londres avant de, de prendre son actuel poste. Christophe a, a, a publié largement sur l'histoire et la théorie de la mode, particulièrement sur le rapport entre mode, masculinité et les métropoles. Donc son dernier livre, et c'est pourquoi il est là aujourd'hui aussi, est intitulé « The Suit, Form, Fashion and... » No, « Form, Function and Style ». Pardon. Euh, le livre est euh, apparu il y a quelques mois, euh, « Re Reaction Books » et l'éditeur. Et c'est maintenant la parole à lui. Merci. Okay. Merci. I'm afraid I'm going to speak in uh, English. But in uh, a wonderful English. <laughs> many, many apologies for that. I wouldn't subject you to... Um, to my terrible French. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, and further apologies, I'm going to talk quite broadly uh, across the chronology. So the, the previous paper was a wonderful example, I think, of a focused study. Uh, but this uh, lecture comes out of, uh, uh, as Adelheid just said, the uh, book that I've just published with Reaction Books which aims to think around the material culture of the suit over the long durée. So it's a lecture about um, clothing as object and as idea. And I aim to trace the suit's really all-pervasive iconography in modern and contemporary culture to show how its very simple forms have emerged Uh, over historical time and how its original meanings have adapted and persisted to denote truths that are much greater than the very basic meeting of cloth, scissors, thread, and the body. So I want to start in the paper with the fundamentals of the suit itself, given that these uh, lectures are about the, um, the object, um, a form that's changed very little about the structure of the suit. And we all know, I think, that in made-up form, the suit is usually characterized by a long-sleeved button jacket with lapels and pockets, a sleeveless waistcoat or a vest worn underneath if three-piece, and long trousers. It's the sort of ideal uh, platonic form in many ways. And the simplicity of its appearance is, of course, belied by the complexity of its construction, both the bespoke and the ready-made suit. This is a, a tailor's guide from the 1940s, a, an English tailor's guide from the London College of Fashion a collection of tailoring uh, ephemera. Um, and as a comparative, more recent study of ready-made suit manufacture, which was commissioned by the British government, Department of Trade and Industry, back at the beginning of this century in 2003, Uh, the complexities of, uh, of suit manufacture 
uh, were becoming a concern of national governments as well. This particular study was commissioned in order to make English tailoring in, in particular and Savile Row tailoring competitive with Italian tailoring. So they, they commissioned a, a big study. Uh, there have been more recent ones around tailoring in Hong Kong and Asia as well. Just to quote you a little, a tailored, a tailored jacket has an intricate structure composed of as many as 40 to 50 components. Its manufacture may involve up to 75 separate operations. The first step in the production process is the marker, a pattern, according to which these many components are cut from the material. The experienced marker tries to configure these so as to waste as little of the cloth as possible. The material is then layered, perhaps with as many as 40 plies at a time, and then cut. The production sequence is, in principle, similar to making cars. And I was fascinated by the way that the mass manufacture of the suit might be equated with the mass production of cards on a, on a Fordist principle, and the way that the suit becomes this, uh, this sense of, uh, uh, of, of, of odor overriding conformity. So the modern ready-made suit, and here's an image from that same uh, 1940s uh, uh, manual for suit cutting, bespoke uh, suit cutting here uh, and making, is the product of a widely recognized and well-ordered system of manufacture. It's been refined and democratized, as many historians have told us, through the 19th and 20th centuries by high street pioneers, and by international brands. And it's present in the wardrobes, I would say, of almost everybody, uh, at least in the Western world. Its bespoke variation continues to be manufactured on traditional lines for an elite minority in the West and a much wider audience now in Asia and in the developing world. Uh, I had, as part of the research for the book, I had a suit made in both in, in London, in Savile Row, and in Hong Kong, uh, in, the, in the quickly made suit uh, area, just to compare those two different things, and was surprised how those two languages speak uh, together. Both options conform to an accepted set of parameters that produce a fairly standardized notion of what a suit should be, how it should look, and how it should feel. But it wasn't always thus, and a little prehistory here uh, before 1820, when the proposition of a suit of clothing, i.e. a well-fitted set of garments, all to be worn at the same time, though not necessarily of matching cloth, emerged in Europe's cities and royal courts during the 14th century, its construction was more likely to constitute a very complex negotiation between the skills of the tailor and other craftsmen and women and the tastes and desires of the client. It was a much more diffuse sense of pulling the suit together. And the possibilities for variation in this earlier period before modernity and modernization were endless. So intriguingly, while the skill of the tailor and the pressures of commodity culture have produced a material history of the modern suit that's marked by subtle variation and an obsession with details, many observers and critics have chosen to damn the suit because of its association with a stifling conformity. And the suit has most often been dismissed as a mere uniform a uniform that regulates difference through disciplining appearances, a uniform that keeps men and women in their place. So and as an example of that, the progressive late 19th century English writer on social struggle, Edward Carpenter, railed against the prison. He saw the suit as a prison uh, of man's free soul. I quote a little here from Edward Carpenter. He said, the truth is one might as well be in one's coffin as in the stiff layers of buckram-like clothing that are commonly worn nowadays. No genial influence from air or sky can pierce this dead hide. 11 layers between man and God. No wonder the Arabian has the advantage over us. Who could be inspired under all this weight of tailordom.
Car Carpenter's not unusual from that, gr that group of, of, uh, of writers. His lament is a particularly interesting one, not least in its evocation of the freedoms of Arabian dress. Because one of the things I try to do in the book is unpack the suit as a Western concept. And I try to pull together a story about the influences of the suit uh, that came from other parts of the world and that were inflected by trade and by politics. And again, a little prehistory here that will probably be familiar to, to you. If we take Charles II's introduction of the Ottoman-inspired vest into the English court, in the autumn of 1666, very precise as the pivotal moment in the birth of the modern three-piece English suit. And one could equally make a case for the introduction of the three-piece suit in the court of uh, Louis XIV in Versailles. And it's interesting the way these two stories um, collapse together and compete with each other. Then we can see that Orientalism was one amongst several influences that inspired the look of the suit's original genesis, so hardly the marker of a stifling conformity. And it's also clear that the new costume adopted by Charles's courtiers achieved in England an unprecedented and welcome uniformity amongst elite and middling civilian ranks. In its earliest iterations, it was revolutionary and it was invigorating. It wasn't constraining at all. The London diarist Samuel Pepys records the effects of this sudden introduction of a new court uniform uh, with acuity. Uh, a quick quote here from Pepys uh, talking about this uniform here. He says, this day, October the 15th, 1666, nearly the same as today, we should have a celebration of the birthday of the suit, I think, the king begins to put on his vest. And I did see several persons in the House of Lords and Commons, great courtiers who are wearing it, a long cassock close to the body of dark cloth, pinked with white silk under it, a coat over it, the legs ruffled with black ribbon like a pigeon's leg. And upon the whole, I wish the king may keep it, for it is a very fine and handsome garment. Now, fine and handsome it might have been, but I think the suit also owes a debt, of course, to military uniform. The uniforms that have preceded it, this 17th century, uh, mid 17th century English version here, and were being reformed at the same time. And in response to the increased introduction of firearms on the battlefields of Europe, in the 17th century, military theorists and commanders had come to the conclusion that greater coordination and cooperation of troops was necessary to gain martial advantage. So a shift from the use of private feudal armies towards permanent salaried regiments of volunteers were the preconditions of manufacture, provision, and development of uniform military dress across all ranks from the late 17th century to the mid 18th century. So in what has become known as the patrimonial era, a striking polychromatic uniformity of battle zone and ceremonial dress, informed and embellished by aspects of local costume, had become something of the norm in European cities, highly, highly familiar. And in mid-18th century France and Prussia, as you'll know, with their spectacular fetishism for bureaucratic control, the military uniform was a potent agent of political court and state control, so a source of much debate. And the material and economic costs and rewards that the uniform business generated were huge. Daniel Roche, of course, has established very clearly that the French army suppliers, just in the period between the late 1720s and uh, early 1760s, were supplying 20,000 outfits a year. 30,000 meters of broadcloth, 3,000 meters of cloth for facings, 100,000 meters of cost cloth for linings. So this becomes an industrial project. The uniform becomes an industrial project on a mass scale. And it's only through understanding this sense of militarization that we can begin to understand the meanings of the material modern 19th and 20th century suit. 
Um, but perhaps the flashiness of the soldiers' get-up takes us only so far in understanding what lies behind the modern suit. There's certainly a degree of equivalence and a tangible synergy between the military impulse to discipline, the practical affordances of uniformity, and the, the development of a costume that's best suited to the new social and political contract. Um, that, that, that battlefield dress really represents a genre of clothing whose meanings were martial. They were about fighting. But other forms of occupational uniform enjoyed a much closer relationship with the values embedded in the 19th century suit in particular. And that's the idea of Protestant religion in particular uh, and, and the sense of disavowal. Nonconformist, and here's a Quaker, uh, an English Quaker family, nonconformist religious ideas and practices relating to plain dressing were more influential still, I think, on the prominence given to the simple suit in the masculine wardrobe, especially in English society and increasingly in American society. Quakers who were required to avoid ornament and extravagance in dress placed a stress on plainness and simplicity, issued the most thorough and precise of sartorial regulations. They informed their followers what was acceptable. They demarcated the functional from the decorative, the necessary from the superfluous. And Quaker meetings, religious meetings, were marked by discussions of troubling lapses into selfish fashionability by wayward members. So there's a sort of race to be the most simple, to be the most plain. And simplicity and plainness therefore become the sort of aesthetic of the ideal suit. And I'm astounded when I look, I was just by the bourse looking at all the young men in their navy blue suits, the great conformity of beautiful, highly plain, paired back blue suits that are competitive in their, their simplicity and their, their, um, their emptiness, in a sense, that goes back to some of these uh, religious uh, moral discussions. But the, the number of Quakers in British society were relatively small. Uh, they were seen by many as, as slightly crankish, and their deliberately unadorned, outdated wardrobes, combined with their eccentric social habits, often made them figures of, of humor and satire rather than emulation. More important still, uh, in, in England and I think in, in English America, were the Methodists, uh, and in Scotland where I live now, led by John Wesley. And this is important because it informs the selling of men's suits in England and America in the 1920s and 1930s, because they're premised on Methodist and Presbyterian ideas. Now, the Methodists, led in the uh, 18th century by John Wesley, uh, enjoyed a much larger following, especially amongst working people, and they popularized Quaker ideas. Wesley's advice to the people called Methodists with regard to dress of late 1760 offered very specific guidelines for appropriate dressing. I quote from Wesley here, he said, buy no velvets, no silks, no fine linen, no superfluities, no mere ornaments, though they might ever be so much in fashion. Wear nothing unless you have it all ready, nothing of a glaring color, nothing which is gay or glistering or showy, nothing made in the height of fashion, nothing to attract the eyes of bystanders. It doesn't leave you with very much leeway. It's nothing, 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 nothing paring down to the absolute essentials. And of course, his advice was grounded in biblical direction and an anti-materialist worldview. Its words were intended to focus the observer's attention towards charity and away from the distractions of worldly temptation. And it provided this broader language for interpreting and practicing the dangerous terrain of sartorial manners that was decorous and proper rather than ostentatious and vain in a burgeoning consumer culture, a modern consumer culture. In that sense, though the homely virtues of plain dressing were taken up much more avidly in the nonconformist haven of North America, where I think they still thrive, when you try to read the dress codes of American businessmen, 
and I'm struck by this in the, the current American political debates, then you still see the, the, the remnants of those uh, underpinning uh, religious arguments. Uh, in Britain, Northern Europe and elsewhere, Wesley's model also provided a perfected context in which suit wearing could develop and prosper beyond national boundaries. Now, to come to our period, to come to the, the, the 19th and early 20th century, all that sobriety inevitably rubbed off on the man's suit and its status in everyday life. Uh, in European cities, in London in particular, tailors and their clients worked hard to identify an appropriate costume for the new professions thrown up by empire, by industry, and by commerce. From the 1840s onwards, that combination of black mourning and frock coats um, to the knee, straight wool trousers, silk top hat, uh, was the favored business costume of members of the Houses of Parliament uh, in England, of city bankers, of stockbrokers, of judges, of barristers, of medical doctors. And the fashion persisted well into the 20th century until it ossified into a form of formal livery still worn at court presentations, at fashionable race meetings in England, at society weddings and at funerals from the 1930s onwards. But more interesting, perhaps, at a lower rung on the social and professional ladder, the dress of the lower middle class office clerk presented alternative templates that challenged some of these assumptions. By the 1880s, the jauntiest style of office workers uh, had prevailed. And the simple combination of shorter jacket, high vest, tapered trousers in one textile pattern worn with a bowler hat constituted what was now commonly known as the lounge suit. And in its more relaxed sense of modernity, the lounge suit found a wider market and a more varied set of social connotations, the morning dress, worn by everyone, from tradesmen and clerks to clergymen to teachers to journalists to all of the new professions. Its neat smartness um, enjoyed a much longer historical trajectory. It bequeathed subsequent generations the business suit of today. But for some, its association still evoked a mournful and monotonous drabness that damned the materialistic impulses of an epoch. The lounge was a fitting costume for a creature that even the president of the National Union of Clerks in England caricatured as a docile being noticeable as the first hope of the suburbs at any time and the last hope of the master class during strikes. If the clerk has given the world any other impression than that of a professional Judas for capitalism, it is the vague idea that he's created the demand for five penny cigarettes and guinea suits. So the clerk is above all else a consumer of fashion, a consumer of the mode. But in 19th century um, North America, the status of the new businessman's suit was rather more optimistic. It was a signifier of progress, of snappy progress. Even in the new world, the rapid changes that sharply pressed, ready-made clothes, polished shoes, bright white detachable collars, the sort of hygiene about, that we heard about in the previous paper, also brought a sense of ambivalence. The rush to profit, the rapid shift from rural to urban values, the erosion of social and sexual differentiation, and the decline of physical labor, and this reification of materialistic novelty favored by clerks, administrators, shop workers, financiers, cause mixed emotions. The great American uh, economic historian, Michael Zakim, who's done uh, a great book on the ready-made clothing industry in New York in the period, captures these tensions very well. He says, no more tangible expression could be found of the regularity and notion of equivalence these citizens brought to bring the, to the industrializing market and the social relations growing around it than the uniformity of their appearance. The dark suits and white linen of their single-priced business attire constituted a capitalist aesthetic. 
It helped these individuals recognize each other's utilitarian fit as their own, and it made everybody a reproduction of the next one. They constituted an industrial spectacle that brought social order to an otherwise disordered situation. This was a ready-made age. And I think there was no better way to demonstrate you were an American if you were a European coming off the boat into America than to immediately buy this sort of clothes, a ready-made suit that signified you as, as belonging to a new equal society. So on the high streets of early and mid 20th century Europe and America, the resulting transformation, and here's a, a, a famous American example, pioneered in retail terms by menswear magnates, uh, including in, in Britain, Austin Reed and Montague Burton, both of whom trained in Chicago, um, produced a consensual understanding of the suit as a defining badge of respectable mis masculinity that survives from the 1920s up until the 1970s to the, to the period of, of your study. And Burtons in uh, Britain were the most effective in pulling together military precision, Quaker moral rectitude, and subtle taste in the manufacture of suits and social attitudes. Almost all British men of a generation own a Burton suits which they would have bought between 1950 and 1970. I, I, I don't joke, every man in Britain has a memory of his first suit being bought from this retailer, Burton's. Uh, they were, um, the historian Frank Moore, the cultural historian, has described um, their, um, their approach, Burton's approach, as a reassuring image of collective cultural conformity, of a shared masculine culture fixed by shopping. It was, uh, through the middle years of the 20th century, the biggest producer of, and seller of menswear in the UK, uh, and it promoted a gentlemanly ideal of extraordinary power. Here's uh, Frank Mort on Burton's. Burton's gentleman acquired status by being absolutely normal. Neither spectacular nor bizarre, nor a clothes crank or an eccentric, he was secure in his personality. Burtons urged their salesmen to avoid dangerous items, loud colours, sporty attire, even soft collars. This wouldn't do at all in the, in the Burtons lexica, lexicon. Uh, its ideal was summed up in the uh, company's famous memorandum to its staff uh, of the 1930s. All excess was to be avoided through restraint and quiet dignity. So here's the advice to shop workers in Burton's uh, from the management. Avoid the severe style of the income tax collector and the smooth tongue of the fortune teller. Cultivate the dignified style of the Quaker tea blender, which is a happy medium. So in order to sell clothes in Burton's shop, you had to come on like a Methodist or a Quaker preacher. That was the best way to sell clothes. Now, these were widely shared sentiments that inspired two generations of British men, middle-class men, to dress in a manner that upheld the discipline associated with military uniform and religious observation. Uh, these traditions seem to have survived the, the tumult of the early 20th century of two world wars intact. And in the 1950s, they encouraged English couturier Hardy Amys, who continued the tradition in the mass market through Hepworths, another English brand selling uh, clothes uh, to, to many English men, to wax lyrical on what he saw as this romantic history of the English suit. In his 1954 autobiography, uh, he says, and I quote him here, it seems to me the principles of our life haven't changed very much. The young man who's just left public school or university dresses in London in a neat dark suit with well-pressed narrow trousers, cuffs to the sleeve of his jacket, lapels to his waistcoat. He would feel uncomfortable in anything other than a hard collar and a bowler hat. His more daring companions may flourish a flowered waistcoat and a velvet collared coat. But if I mention two eccentric examples, I may frighten the reader out of my argument. Let us agree that the average young man of position tries to give an air of substance, of having time for the niceties of life. His appearance may only be demonstrating wishful thinking, 
that he has several thousand pounds a year in the funds, that he, he's prepared to be a good father. Um, uh, but I think the wish is there all right, even if the reality is wanting. So coming to the end here, Amy's passionate wish for the preservation of sartorial traditions was in some ways answered. For the, through the social revolutions and style innovations of the 60s and 70s, although these threatened the dominance of respectability in the suit, its symbolic associations continue to reverberate through the streets of British and North American cities. In America, the business suit enjoyed a revival buoyed up by the success of John T. Malloy's famous books, Dress for Success of 1975 and The Woman's Dress for Success book of 1977. And Malloy, of course, had worked as an image consultant for many US companies, published a column on office style in the Los Angeles Times. And in an era of Cold War paranoia and economic uncertainty, his mantra was essentially conservative. It worked against the freedoms of the counterculture in favor, favor of scientific market and situational research in real business situations, which revealed that men knew what was best for themselves in the choice of clothing, and the classic suit and tie were the ultimate in authority, or what would become known popularly in, in popular terms as power dressing. So across the Atlantic, back in London, at the end uh, of the 1970s, beginning of the, of the 1980s, it would be another eight years before financial deregulation and Big Bang opened up the city of London to modernization in 1986. But already its complacent inhabitants were beginning to feel the heat of competition. And you get a return to a sort of neo-Georgian dandyism uh, Arabor. This is Nick Fuchs. Many of you may know a, a, a quite famous uh, English uh, tailoring correspondent and journalism. Uh, family connections and membership of the Wright Club in the early 1980s were no longer enough to guarantee a place uh, on the board or the trading floor of big city financial uh, trading houses. Uh, and in the context of a rapidly globalizing knowledge economy, where strategic and technological brilliance were at a premium rather than the correct an accent and appropriate taste, sartorial taste, the suit still remained a key indicator of the ability to fit. And it's resurfaced just in the last two months, where uh, there's a report that young British men aren't getting good jobs in the city because they're persisting in wearing brown shoes to their job interviews, and those trained in public schools are pointing them out as unsocial and not appropriate for those sort of high-powered jobs. So these sorts of things still persist. And a city headhunter of the early 1980s could claim that I'm not recruiting people who've merely got the taste to buy the right sort of stripy suit. They've got to be able to make money, a lot of money. But nobody denied that the striped suit was in decline itself. On the contrary, uh, the authority of good tailoring seemed to increase in value. All, of course, would change by the turn of the century when informed by management philosophy and the laissez-faire non-hierarchical structures of the booming dot-com sector, many blue chip companies appeared to relax their dress codes. Uh, and, of course, the introduction of sportswear, uh, chinos and polo shirts in the office space uh, become symptomatic, perhaps, of a loss of trust in the suit. And I think it's no uh, coincidence that in 2008, when Lehman Brothers first collapsed, the beginning of the financial crisis that we're still in now, that the employees in London, who were made redundant from their city jobs, were shown on the television news leaving their offices in chinos and polo shirts rather than appropriate business attire. Um, it, uh, so, so that's a highly symbolic. Nothing could have been more symbolic of a collapse in public trust of the private institutions in which people place their mortgages, their savings, their pensions than the lack of a well-cut suit. So for all its uniform conformity, Here's an outfit expressly developed over centuries to inspire confidence. 
its apparent neglect had already been a short-sighted move and its prospects seem bleak. So the longevity around these arguments, around the material, the philosophical, the aesthetic and the political qualities of the suit form the book that I've just published. Uh, its chapters are more wide ranging. Uh, it thinks about the suit's status of a, as a vessel for trade and nationalist sentiment. It thinks about its development in various regions across the world. Uh, it thinks about the suit as an oppositional style, as a subcultural style. And it thinks about the suit as an inspiration for writers and artists, both in the mainstream culture and in the avant-garde. And I end the book with this line. Uh, in the suit's extraordinary survival, there's reason to hold out hope that even in the era when Donald Trump's poorly fitted, highly expensive suits are subject to critique in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, that the suit will endure, provided that those reason, values of reason, of equality, of beauty, and of progress that characterize human civilization endure with it. So I'm trying to say that the suit is a civilized material thing, and we have to treat it with care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher, for sharing these broad views on a, such an important piece of uh, masculine attire with us. Um, it's really a shame that we don't have a copy of the book here, but we don't have it here because you should buy it. <laughs> I hope that it's available here in some Paris bookshops. I'm sure in the good ones you will find it. Um, bon, merci. Je passe au français pour uh, vous encourager donc de de faire vos questions. Je commence avec une petite question. Je fais mes questions en anglais, je préfère, pour être clair. Um, I wonder if you have um, worked with some dress codes of the 19th or early 20th century concerning business outfits. Do, do they exist in Great Britain? I'm sure, because uh, how did they, what did they express concerning the suit? In fact, in that book that I wrote a very long time ago, in the, in the Hidden Consumer, mm -hmm. that um, you, you kindly quoted from, I used an awful lot of material uh, that demonstrated how the boundaries of appropriate dressing in the 19th century office were laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of information, actually, there's an awful lot of autobiographical information mm -hmm. and diary information where young men going into work for the first time describe how the pressures they felt and the sort of okay. guidance they were getting from their seniors in particular. So mm -hmm. there's oral uh, advice yep. um, from your boss or from your father as to what was appropriate to wear in the office. But then, of course, there's a burgeoning literature, popular literature, magazine literature. Um, the Modern Man is a, is a key uh, English one for young men to read that has sartorial advice mm -hmm. columns that give very clear and detailed advice on what to wear. And then your, your tailor was, the mo so. was, a, was, was perhaps the most knowledgeable source of mm. advice as well. So a lot of tailoring magazines and tailoring guidance that, that were there to, to um, and, and yeah, all that. So other questions, please. Um, So, yeah, it's a, it's a big great debating, question. It's a persisting debating point, the great masculine renunciation. My feeling on it is that um, it was an idea, of course, that was coined most famously by J.C. Flugel, um, uh, uh, a, a post-Freudian working at University College London, I think in the 19, early 1930s. Even early um, 20s. So I read it more as a reaction of the burgeoning industry of psychoanalysis and its interest in dress in the 1930s as a reaction against the dress of their forefathers, their grandfathers in the 19th century. So it's a 1920s reaction, an excessive 1920s reaction to an assumed 19th century repression 
Um, so I don't actually think it, it, it actually happened. And I think in the book I'm trying to trace a longer history of a counter-aesthetic that isn't renouncing any, anything. It's a, a long history of, 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 of purity, which isn't about renunciation. It's about control. Um, but the concept, the great masculine renunciation, is a historiographical one that's very firmly rooted in the circumstances of the 1930s, not the circumstances of the 1760s or the 1820s. Um, so it's interesting. It's interesting. When we look at 19th century fashion, uh, fashion magazines concerning men, we are finding a lot of colored pieces, striped pieces, suits, um, checked, everything. If you look to uh, sample books of um, yeah. clothes, cloth, yes. it's the same. Yes. So how would you say, what, what should we do with these two lines? Let's say the sober, the plain line, the black yeah. one, the is this yeah. the British one, the Puritan uh, one, no. and the other one is the no. Baroque? Um, no, I start Central off Central Europe one, I, or I mean, what, one of my favourite passages in in the in the book that I've written is in the first chapter. Uh, I, I quote and I make a poem out of uh, a textile, uh, a wool trader's mm -hmm. uh, uh, description of the, the sorts of appropriate cloths. Uh, that might be used, and, and it's extraordinary the variety there, as you say, both in texture, it's incredible, in pattern, it's so coloured, and in colour. Mm. Uh, and here, was, here was a choice that was laid out um, for for men, not not just in Savile Row. Uh, I've seen boxes of um, samples, textile samples that uh, American salesmen would uh, would take around the Midwest as well in the 1930s that are even louder in their colours, lime greens and with, with, with bright red stripes and uh, beautiful petrol blues. Uh, and I think we tend to inform ourselves through the black and white photograph and the, um, uh, the, the monochrome uh, line drawing about the realities of life. And we need to put those two things together mm -hmm. and comb out uh, a, a, a great propensity for colour, I think, in, in the masculine wardrobe, particularly in ho hosiery as well. Um, and, and contrasting colours is definitely there. Yeah, probably it's really a question of what has uh, come survived. up to us, yeah. survived in, yeah. in museums collections. We all yes. know that there is very little evidence of coloured yes. men's wear. Yes. And as you said, many of the line drawings also give a false idea. Yes. But when you look at all these professional tailor magazines, they very often have coloured um, yes. um, plates, yes. supplements. Yes. And in the, it's, it's interesting, the, I mean this, I'm, I'm sure uh, curators here will understand this, but the Museum of London has a very good everyday dress collection with, with quite a good menswear collection in it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of 19th century Clark suits, uh, but the curators were always frustrated because of course those suits were only donated because they were the suits that those men had worn to their weddings. So they were very particular sort of suit, the, mm. the, the black suit. Uh, they may have been worn for other things as well, but they weren't typical. Maybe first the lady over there and then yours. <laughs> You can also, uh, vous pouvez demander en, en, en français si vous voulez, je peux traduire si ça vous. Uh, sure. Yeah, sure, um, ask in English. <laughs> Yeah, this was a this was a provocation and, and yeah, sure. appropriate for the city in which we're uh, we're speaking. Um, yeah, we understand the suit as a as a masculine uh, object, um, but uh, I do talk, I I am interested in the way, particularly in which um, uh, there's a there's a section in the book. Uh, about the way that uh, for a short period in the late 19th century, young men's fashion was led by um, uh, women performers on the music hall stage. So that, uh, that, uh, that uh, tradition of cross-dressing, vestatilly, uh, and uh, that, that was both uh, uh, influential also for emerging lesbian subcultures, I think, in the 1890s and 1920s, I say a little bit about that. 
but I was, in, in doing the primary research uh, earlier, I was astounded from the autobiography of female cross-dressers on, on the British musical stage, at least, and I'm sure it's true uh, in Germany and in um, that their followers, of course, were young men, were bank clerks in their 20s, uh, and they would follow every trend from, um, from cufflinks to... Um, to the way Vesta Tilly was, she was lampooning them and they were following, crit critiquing them. So there's a strong uh, subversive line uh, of uh, women wearing the suit that becomes influential for the, for the masculine suit, I think, that's, that's interesting. So that's one line that I, that I take. No, because I want to sell the book to some, some good fe some, some female colleagues as well. Um, um, I've heard that argument um, expressed by fashion journalists as well, especially menswear journalists, that innovation is driven uh, through tailoring, I think. So it's about innovation being driven through cut and through drape. Uh, and perhaps you can get more spectacular innovation or uh, more of a, uh, a sea change uh, in shifts in tailoring than you can with drape, perhaps. I make a strong argument in the book, and we were talking about Adolf Loos earlier, that some of the most interesting writing about the suit uh, is actually produced by architects uh, rather than by um, uh, fashion designers or by tailors. Uh, so there's something there again about aesthetic innovation and the idea of the three-dimensional object that the suit really does embody, which I think Anne Hollander is getting at in terms of the suit's relationship to the body and, and as an architectural form. Um, so in that sense, it, it falls more easily into uh, that modernist concept of innovation. It's perhaps what's happening. Um, but I wouldn't argue that, um, uh, that, that, that women's wear and men's wear are somehow competing in terms of of their revolutionary aspects. I think it came with the same argument as the uh, renunciation, right, you know, okay. that yeah. men are more modern and women right, are still yes. old-fashioned yeah. and staying Unlast, home and only yeah, wearing ornament. uncomfortable dresses, yeah. probably. Okay. Um, I wonder, you said at the beginning that you have, may, have had made a suit in London and one in Hong Kong or somewhere else. Yes. Could you tell us a word about this, even so if it's not uh, at the it's not really, yes, it's line not. of our, but that's interesting. What yeah. did they express to you? So you and can why read. did you have them made for you or for the book or for, I did. to you, explain? Well, for, 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 for broader um, hmm? research on, on men's it's wear. So I was very lucky with the, with the London suit that I had made, because that was made for me by the British Council. So that was a Savile Row suit. Best that solution. Was, that was paid for for um, an exhibition that toured in about 2003, I think, um, on, uh, it was called The New British Dandy, and it mm -hmm. was about uh, uh, tailoring. And we needed uh, an Alexander McQueen suit. He was working for a Savile Row tailor famously at the time, and and did a line of, of uh, come back to Savile Row and did a, a, an unpopular line of, um, uh, of, of bespoke suits for them. So you, to have a bespoke suit, it has to be made to the body. So it was, as co-curator, it was my body that the suit was made to, but that was my fee. I didn't take a fee. The fee was to, to have the suit made, yeah. made in this wonderful, uh, this wonderful suit. Uh, so I've written in some depth about that in the, in the Alexander McQueen catalogue for the V&A exhibition, how it felt, what it meant in terms of uh, McQueen's history. And it is an extraordinary suit to wear. It doesn't fit me anymore. I need to take it back to Savile Row and have it altered. I've grown bigger, but um, it felt like wearing water is the only way I can describe it. It flowed over the body in an extraordinary way. Uh, and the making of that suit in a Savile Row showroom was 19th century in its aspects, the way the tailor dealt with me and dealt with my body. The Hong Kong suit, I wanted to get the sense of uh, the way 
that perhaps clothes were made historically. And I was fascinated by the way that you could make not a bespoke suit, but a made-to-measure suit uh, in a weekend over three days. Uh, and I wanted to compare that with the experience of the bespoke suit. And it was terrifying uh, because your trust was put even more in the hands of a very skilled tailor, a skilled salesman. Uh, and of course, like all tourists in Hong Kong, you're up against the clock. You think you're going to lose all your money and go home without a suit. And I think I went 20 shirts or something were thrown in as, a, as the extra. I had to buy an extra suitcase. Uh, and when I went back for the final fitting, I went, I, you, you did go for two fittings. Two fittings. Mm -hmm. um, I had to get on the back of a moped and whiz round to the workshop, which was uh, three streets but uh, in away. Your, in your new suit. Um, no, to no, see to, it there. To, to, to have it because it was still there and then oh, they quickly okay. made it up and brought it back. So I thought that must be something like the experience of getting a suit not quite compressed, but that sense of mm. different manufacturers in different parts of the city mm. working together to produce one thing very quickly um, to, to the tailor's order was a very different system of working, but still fascinating. The suit doesn't fit very well. Uh, I, I, I've got two of them and they are, mm. they're high up. I've, mm. I've learned my lesson, but it was a good, good experience. So. Thank you. That's the story of the suit, the suits. <laughs> Thank you very much again.